This time on Low Buck Garage, I do some precision body work. I give you some lawn care tips. Luckily, a while back, I ran over my garden hose with the lawnmower. I talk about safety. So do not drink, inhale, or bathe in this stuff. And then this happens. Now that I've got this bus working well, the bits of rust here and there are really kind of bugging me. There's a few things I gotta take care of. My dad has been hanging on to this model bus for probably a decade, maybe more. He always told me that this would be a good paint job for the bus, except not red, and the roof had to be a light color. But other than the actual details, he liked this paint job. I'm gonna try to recreate this in a 34 foot long full size version. That should be easy enough. I'm starting with the roof and looking for any obvious leaks. There's a lot of roof. I'm gonna add a little sealer under here before I do the rivets. That'll be better. I'm taking a close look at this rust hole. That isn't all the way through. It's through the top layer easily, but looks like this layer went all the way past these rivets over here somewhere. So that's actually kind of solid. So I'm going to start with replacing all the old rivets. Then I'm going to use some of this waterproof body filler. And magically the hole disappears and is waterproof. There's a few rivets missing here and there. I'm going to take care of those too. I noticed some bubbling up on the roof here. So I figured I'd knock down the high spots, get rid of the loose stuff and repaint it. I opened a can of worms here. This is what I found under here. Apparently, the loose stuff is the roof. This is going to be a bigger project than I expected. I am finding rust holes everywhere and super thick layers of Bondo. And I'm betting it's going to be the same thing the entire length down. When my dad bought it, this bus had just been painted a couple years before. Apparently, they like their Bondo. Well, this is a good opportunity. This is a two-layer roof. There's no insulation between it. Might as well use this as an excuse to add insulation. There's a couple of rivets still there. Most of them are already eaten through. So this rust is helping. Kinda. Luckily this piece here is really thick, so it's still got a lot of meat to it left. Now I can see between the layers of the roof. I notice there's a little bit of insulation here, and that one bit is actually a problem. Right here is a bundle of wires, and it goes right into it. If I need to do anything with those wires, that insulation had them trapped inside. That right there is the backside of a light that's on the inside. I could just take these lights out, and I have access to that channel from the inside, right where all those wires are. So if I ever need to run wires or move them, I don't want insulation filling this channel. The only exception to that is the roof here. I gotta have a wire going to that. I started by removing as many of the loose chunks of rust as I could. I bought the longest foam gun I could find. Let's see how far I can get in there. There we go, that's the end. I can do this. Goes through this stuff fast. I don't see it coming out anywhere inside. That's good. I wish I had a trigger lock. So I added a trigger lock. I added foam up to the rivets so I can fold this piece down. And that's as far as I want to go because I don't want it to start lifting up. These will hold that panel roughly in position. So that way as the foam expands will be the right shape. And then I can start attaching rivets and fill in the rest but I still am not gonna go all the way. If I foam all the way down, it's gonna lock these wires in place and I want them to be able to move. I wanna be able to use this channel for future wire adjustments and for my current air conditioner wire. But my air conditioner is in the center of the vehicle. I need to get the wire through right where I'm gonna be foaming. But I still wanna be able to move that wire when needed. Luckily, a while back, I ran over my garden hose with the lawnmower. And this is the mistake that keeps on giving. 
So I'm gonna run this through the roof and then slide the wire inside the hose. Now when I install this air conditioner, I used some wood block spacers and left a gap. Just about the right size for this garden hose. I'm gonna go ahead and slide it through here all the way to one of those lights. I just removed this light fixture. There's our piece of garden hose. And there's our power feed cable. I got the gun jammed in the roof with the trigger lock on, so that's filling that section. I'm gonna start attaching some of the tops of these. I've got the bus roof in position with a combination of Clecos, clamps, and straps. If you've never used them before, Clecos are a handy tool for doing riveted assemblies. Basically, it's a little spring-loaded piece. You use a pair of pliers, squeeze the end, that extends two arms, they compress together. When you release it, the piece in the middle spreads them apart. Put it through the hole, put it through the next thing you want to rivet it to, let go, and this is now held in place. You can see the little arm is expanded to hold the two together. And then, if you want to take it apart, you just squish it again, and it pulls right apart. So that foam is gonna form the right shape, but then I can take out all those Clecos and slide my patch panel under, and then do the actual riveting that holds it finally in place. Out of the dozen cans I initially bought, I had half of one can left, so I figure I'll dump it out through the interior vent Try to get a little bit of this area filled up. I'm putting this yellow primer on any exposed rusted areas that look like they have some rust, but aren't so bad that I'm gonna to have to replace the whole panel. This is a mil-spec zinc chromate primer. That zinc chromate is really good at preventing corrosion. It is also extremely toxic, so do not drink, inhale, or bathe in this stuff. I'm also gonna hit the surface where I'm gonna be riveting on this new panel. This primer is good stuff that you definitely should not buy. You can get it for free. Now this is used in a lot of industries, in aircraft applications and military applications and stuff like that. And that is why you don't have to buy it. It has an expiration date. Places like that, they need to certify their work. They can't use expired stuff. Also, it's expensive for them to get rid of because it's hazardous waste. So if you find a place using this stuff, They'll gladly give you their old stuff to get it out of the building. It's actually slotting under there. I didn't want to think about what it takes to take out this curve section. So I just lifted it up a little bit. It looks like I got this to slide under and we got this piece under the roof. So the water will go right over. I just got to get this to slide back. So this rain gutter is more exposed. I got this tool for interior work that it seems to be the thing I need. You just pry that up a little bit. And now that'll go into place. Just have to rivet everything back together. Now this bus was originally held together with 3 16th diameter aluminum solid rivets. Over the past 70 years, some of them have corroded away. You can see this one here where you can tell where a rivet was, but there is no head on the rivet anymore like there is on the other ones. Let me show you the technique I'm using. First, I start with a drill that is not 3 16th. It's actually smaller, so I don't have to worry about hitting it on center very well. Now next, I'm not drilling all the way through. There's still a bottom there. Now I take a hammer and punch and use that bottom that's still there to drive out the rivet. Now if I went with the right size drill, I probably would have turned that hole oval. But now I've got the right size hole that's the right diameter in the original location. And here's the back side of the rivet head. You can see where the hole wasn't drilled all the way through and it just drove out cleanly. Now I have two replacement options. I bought stainless steel rivets. Solid rivets are solid, so they are stronger than pop rivets that are hollow but stainless steel is stronger than aluminum. So now I can put this rivet in and completely replace it because my hole is just like it was originally. 
Or if it looks like there's extra corrosion around the hole and the hole is actually weaker, I've got some quarter inch stainless steel rivets. I can use the original hole as a pilot, drill through it with a quarter inch bit and pop that in place. And seeing how there's a seam of a door and it's pretty thick and could catch on something, I'm gonna go bigger. Got the oversized rivet installed and popped into place. That's fixed. Now I just have to do this around 376 more times and I should be all set. I started keeping my old rivet tails. I may have underestimated the number of rivets required. There's a lot of them. Now as I was working on this bust, I noticed little areas where the paint was bubbling up. I took a wire brush to it. The moisture that got trapped between the walls is causing this bust to rust from the inside out. The only way to actually fix it properly would be to take out the whole exterior surface of metal and then treat the rust areas, replace a lot of the metal, and put it all back together. And I know myself, if I start that project, I will never finish it. And that's a good thing. Since I know I'm not going to finish it, I'm not going to start it. So I have to refinish this bus in a way that I can patch it and touch it up really easily as it goes. That I can do. These aren't big enough for bothering with a patch panel. So I'm going with the fiberglass filled Bondo. This stuff is actually surprisingly strong. Eh, let's make a big pile. I got a lot of them. Of course you want to precisely measure the hardener, so I just put a blob on. As this body filler cures, it goes from real goopy to kind of a cheese-like phase before it actually gets to be rigid and solid. This right here is a very handy phase. Because you can take something like a steak knife and just carve away bits you don't want. You can actually shape this stuff pretty well, and then you don't have to sand it. High spots like this one. There. Now I don't have to worry about getting in there sandpaper. On these gaps, you can just saw away the excess. Hard to reach areas. I was still working on the bodywork on the sides, but the roof was ready for paint. I got most of it with a roller, some spots I just couldn't get to, like these edges here. Luckily, this same color comes in a rattle can. That's easier. I want to talk for a minute about clearance lights. I never paid attention to them, but one day I got an email from a company that asked me if I wanted to try out their clearance lights as a replacement. This is what was on the bus. They look kind of big and clunky. Some are mounted vertically, some are mounted horizontally. Just didn't seem to quite fit. So I figured I'd take a look at this new company's products and see what they had. And I found these. Chrome trimmed oval clearance marker light kind of thing. The whole bus is round everywhere and this I think will fit a lot better. So they sent me them. But I had looked at their catalog a little further. Now this bus uses a few different taillights. We got standard four inch round ones here. That's a reflector. Then we have a seven inch round amber turn signal and a seven inch round red that is a tail and brake light. That's a lot of lights. And these seven inch ones are not as common and easy to find. This place had them, and they sent me those too. I started liking this part sand place. They're geared more towards the heavy truck side of things and carry stuff like these big seven inch diameter lights. But what about the brake lights? These are the ones I chose. And this is a combination tail light, high beam for brake and turn, and then the center has a backup light. I thought this would be a neat solution to get everything all in one. However, the people at Partsam decided that they might have one I'd like better. So they sent me the ones I wanted. They also sent me another set. These are a solid red with the low and high beam so I can do my braking and turn signaling and all that. But it looks like these are going to be brighter. So we're going to get a comparison test. But I didn't stop there. I also got some exterior lights. Now I've been wanting exterior lights since I put the grill in, 
And these mount right on the side and they put the light pointing downwards. So we can hook it flat on the side and the light should shine down to where I need it to be. I'm not done yet. This is an LED light that's an oval and it has a switch on it. I know for sure one of these is going in the engine compartment so I can turn on a light in there whenever I need it. It comes with both an amber and a clear lens. We'll try them both out. I also got some four inch round backup lights in case I need them for something. There's a lot of stuff here. Now I've got a lot of stuff to install, but these are basically replacements for ones that I already had. But all these have incandescent bulbs. And with this many of them on, that's a lot of amperage. When you're dealing with a 70 year old bus and wiring that looks like that, less amperage is better. With all these lights being LED, I should be saving a lot of power. Now that I'm uncovering some of these connections, I'm kind of glad I'm replacing the lights. I'm kind of surprised that's even still working. This is the ground wire for that turn signal. And no, I didn't loosen that screw yet. That's the way it was. It just had a wad of electrical tape wrapped around it. These old reflectors had new reflectors stuck to them. I peeled it off. There's moss, there's bugs. That's gotta go. It's kind of interesting. The one screw that has the ground strap is completely corroded away. And all of them. Now luckily these lights are on this engine compartment lid. So I can get to the back side of them with vice grips. That makes life a lot easier. I have fixed dozens of little flaws on the side of this bus. And as I did it, I discovered there's hundreds more. And as I was trying to come up with a good excuse to not actually fix all the body flaws, I thought of something. A few months ago when I was really gung-ho about getting a proper coatings for this bus, I bought myself this Duraback 18. It's not a paint, it's more of a rubbery bedliner-like coating that can be applied with a roller and easily touched up. And it looked like the best option. This stuff says it covers up imperfections. In order to get a good idea what it can cover up, I need to leave flaws, otherwise we won't learn anything. Let's see what this stuff can do. We've got some pitting here, more pitting, lots more pitting here. This area has a lot of cracks in old Bondo. A lot more old Bondo cracks than this area. There's some little pinholes here, here. We'll look at them after we coat it and see how visible they are. Got a funky smell to it. Let's see how it looks. We'll see what happens when it dries. I dragged home the front bumper from the other Kenworth bus. Now it's time for it to go there. Now this original bumper is a little over eight inches tall. These mounting plates are 12. They've got to come off. Welded the bottom too. <sighs> okay. Luckily, they didn't do a very good weld on the inside. Now, the critical question do these actually line up? Now I'm glad I dragged that bumper 2,500 miles. That looks much better. Or it will once I paint it. I was prepping this bumper by getting rid of the really flaky stuff and rusty areas. I noticed a lot of marks here. There's a little dents right around the area it mounts to the frame on both sides. Looks like those are made by chains. Somehow it doesn't surprise me that this bus has spent some time being towed by a chain. Now that this stuff has dried thoroughly, let's see what it covers up. You can see a tiny gap there, but most of it's gone. Pit's smaller than this one it did fill. Obviously, that's getting too big. And it really pretty much filled most of it in. It's not a smooth, glossy finish, but it's not too bad. And it hides a lot, so I'm pretty happy with this. It's real similar to the texture of the roof that was rollered on too. I painted the back and one side of the bus with the first gallon, then moved it to a new spot to do the front and the other side. So the work continues. I learned something important about this Durabag stuff. I painted over a lot of locks with regular paint. I've always been able to just shove the key in them and make them operate. 
This stuff doesn't work the same. Uh, if you have locks or something, mask them off first. Something's turning. Good enough. There's a lesson learned. Glad I did that before I painted all of them. Cut the lock cylinders apart. I'm letting them soak in a little puddle of brake fluid. See, it seems to be cleaning that stuff off nicely. Hopefully it gets in all the little tumblers. The body work kept going on and on and on. There's a lot of bus here. One problem I've been running into is there's so much buzz. As I work on it, I see flaws. When I get the body filler mixed and I walk around, I forget some. I'm going around attaching pieces of tape. I'll see the pieces of tape and know to look at that spot. Whoever did this body work before my dad got the bus really laid that bondo on thick. Now, after my experience with the blue, I have a feeling I can cover up surface texture issues, like this bondo that isn't perfectly smooth. So rather than actually fixing that, I'm gonna leave it so we can learn whether or not it gets covered up properly. Got a little more here, got a small crack here, and then a bigger crack here. So let's completely ignore those flaws and go ahead and paint over them and see what'll cover up. That seems like more fun. I tried to mask off the rubber gaskets on the glass, but they're so deteriorated, the masking tape didn't really stick. I figure the coating's not gonna stick either. I'm just gonna take some common or something and wash them off after this dries thoroughly. Worst case scenario, looks like they need to be replaced pretty soon anyway. When I was taking off this emblem, I noticed there's old remnants of red paint in little corners here and there. Go with a matte clear, because I don't want it to be too shiny. The roof and back were already dry, so I could work in the lights while the rest of this stuff dries. All right, on the low taillight beam, 0 0.06 amps. That is not drawing much at all. If we switch to the brake light side, 0.49, so less than half an amp. And the tail setting, 0 0.09, 0 0.08 amps. Actually more than the other LED light. And bright, we're at 0.25, which is less. Backup lights, 0.16. Here's one of the original tail lights. Here's running section, 0.55 amps. And bright, all right, and that is over two amps. Now this is one of the amber turn signals, 0 0.06 on low, 0 0.18 on high. One of the original turn signals, 1.98, like 10 times more. Here's one of the original clearance lights, 0.64 amps. There's 10 of these, 0 0.03. It's like 20 times less. Now both these lights need to be grounded. And I notice there's a lot of extra holes around this amber one. Now I'm gonna pop a small bolt. There's a the number six. Now we got a grounding stud. I can go ahead and put this light back in. Now I could have made one of these mounting screws a ground, but this way I can remove either light and it doesn't change the ground for the other. And if I have anything else around here I need to ground, I can attach it to the same stud. Now I've got one of each taillight mounted and we can do a comparison. I like the idea of that one because it has everything all in one unit, including backup lights. Appearance-wise, I like this one better. Looks more traditional. Let's see what they look like at night. That one is definitely brighter. And that one still looks like an eye staring at you. I'm working on installing these clearance lights here. And I have to run a separate ground wire. What I figured I'd do is run it back around and go to one of the mounting screws. But when I install this, the wire keeps it from sitting flat. And I don't want it to be out this far. This wire isn't that huge inside, but it's got nice, thick, heavy insulation. And that makes it a pretty big diameter. So then I was thinking, this is a ground. What do I need insulation for? So I stripped about two inches of insulation off, and that is about as flush as you could possibly be. And if that connects to the body, it's just a better ground. There's a little bezel on. I think that's a lot better than the old ones. Now that I know where the clearance light's going, I can touch up the area around it Looks like some old gasket stuck on here from the last one. I could just touch it up as I go. There, paint's all set. Fill up the holes I don't need. There, full and waterproof. Make sure the back of this is waterproof. There we go. When I tightened the lights down, the curvature of the roof really twisted the bases. They still work fine, but the bezels didn't snap on as nicely. 
So I used a little bit of the extra silicone to go ahead and make sure those stayed in place. One down, nine to go. It even works. That's a bonus. Now right here is where these original reflectors went. But I don't want to put these back on because besides looking kind of gross, they didn't really work well. Both of these new lights have reflectors built into the center. So these aren't needed at all. I got that set of four inch round stuff. My plan is to somehow fit that there. But it came with these nice backup lights, which I could put right there. These are grommet mount style. You drill a big hole, you put the grommet in, you shove the light in, everything's totally fine. So all I have to do is make one hole. But that'll inset this so that the light is actually below the metal. And all the other lights stick out a little bit. And that might look weird. So I'm going to try something different. I was looking at these old reflectors. And they have a metal frame that already has holes drilled in it that match. I flipped them over. It looks like this is a separate piece. There we go. Now we got a frame. Actually, I'll throw this in my spare parts bin. That might come in handy. Now here's my bare frame. Doesn't quite fit, but it's really close. Got the inner ring severed. That saves a lot of cutting time. Now here's the modified frame. The light fits in just like that. Is it does have wires coming out the back, which I'll have to make a hole for. I don't have to make this whole big hole. I think small one will do just fine. That looks pretty good. It is a little bit sloppy though. I always save the good foam out of packaging. That's good. And now it was time for the last color. I made a tool out of a square and a piece of tape so I could get my lines kind of straight. Sort of. Since I'm going to paint this with a roller, I'm using that to size where my arches are, so that way I can actually paint it. Except for all the jaggedness, it's kind of an arc. And I just got to figure out the swoops that way. This trash can lid was handy. I think that is the perfect radius. Let me check the model. Now this swoop is much longer, so I'm definitely going to have to go with a bigger radius. I think I'll just freehand it. Something like that. I think that's better. Since I had already gone through two gallons of this Duraback, I thought I knew what I was getting into. This dark blue is a completely different animal. It started off when I literally had to mangle the entire top to get the lid off. You can see it actually ripped the can up in order to get the lid off it. And this is sticky like you wouldn't believe. This is basically just complete goop. I've used glue that is less sticky than this stuff. This piece of trim used to go right here. When we started painting it, it was so sticky it actually ripped the trim completely off. It pulled the masking tape right off. You can hear the stickiness. Want to paint a door? The door sticks to the roller. And it looks like the fuzz of the roller is starting to come off and stick in the paint. Oh yeah, and it's dark out too. That helps. This is going about as expected. I rolled it and then bent the aluminum because it stuck so much to the roller. Well, let's keep going. We're kind of committed now. Oops. The level of sticky is insane. So, I'll be here for a while. Now, as thick as all this goop is, I'm taking all this tape off tonight. In the dark, I think it looks pretty good. It's the next day, and I'm pretty happy with the way this stuff turned out. Those dimples in the Bondo, completely covered up. All the minor stuff is gone. This is that big crack. There's the end of it. You can find it if you're looking for it, but mostly covered up. The dark color helps too. I'm very glad I stopped doing body work when I did, because I don't think any more body work would have really helped any. I think it's going to look okay. There's a few spots I need to deal with. Here, where the roller went over the tape. Here, where it bled under the tape. Here, where my tape curvature became a jagged line. And here, where it didn't quite make it to the next color. There's some runs. We'll just fix that. There, all fixed. But luckily, I have spare both colors, and so I can do touch-ups like this. Now, I read the instructions this morning, and they say that you can brush your roll it on easily, which I know is not true with how thick that stuff was. They also say you can spray it. 
and to spray it, you thin it down and that might make it flow a little better. I'm supposed to use uh, xylene, I think it is, as the thinner. I don't have any, but I'm gonna get some. And once I get that, then I'll do all those touch-ups and I think it'll flow better. Well, that's the whole point of this coating system. I can just do touch-ups whenever and it'll blend right in. So we'll see how that works. Three out of the four bumper bolts fit perfect. Luckily, that's an easy problem to fix. There, problem solved. Kinda acts like normal paint. This color stirs the can along with the goop. Gonna add too much thinner. It's kind of starting to blend in. Now it's about a third thinner and it seems to be working. This is another learn from my mistakes moment. If you go to use this stuff, make sure you have the thinner on hand in case it comes out goopy. That would have saved a lot of effort that night. This stuff works a lot better when it actually flows. Now with it about a third thinner, I can actually do some rollering and have the roller stay together. I'll just get rid of the zigzags. No problem. And then I realized the brake lights were shorting out to the headlights. Something new to play with. I'm trying to trace and isolate. It goes here and it's that big bundle of wires that are all yellow. They go up into the roof line. Remember that bundle of all yellow wires going through the roof? Apparently that is my signal light wires. So some of the time when I was working on the roof, I ended up shorting them out. Right now, I am really glad I didn't foam this whole area and they can still move. So now I gotta figure out what I did and replace it. I used a test light and probed them, identified these two wires have power. So one of these is brake lights, one of these is running lights. The thing is, I don't know where the problem is because that way I have the area where I added the air conditioner wire and I could have damaged something there. And that way is the area where I repaired the roof and I could have damaged something there. I don't know which side the problem is and which wires to replace. So I think I got to snip one. In the movies, these all have different colors, but I'm going to pick this one. Now, right now I have the running lights turned on. The brake lights are not activated. And the wire that's connected has power. The end going forward of the other wire has no power. The end going backwards, we've got power. Which means the one I cut is our brake light because the power is not coming from up front where the switch is. The power is coming out of the brake light wire backwards. Somehow this end of the wire is connected to the tail light wire that way in the back of the bus. Use one of these solder seal connectors to connect the wire that I know is shorted to a new wire and another wire. Now I'm not actually gonna use that to connect electricity. I'm gonna use that to pull and hopefully that's strong enough to drag these two wires where that one used to go. Made it about 10 feet and that connector broke. It worked well, it was easy. As soon as it got hard, that thing ripped. I've decided to go straight to cheating here. There's something blocking this channel and I can't get the wires through. So I ran in between the upholstery panels. I'm gonna tuck these wires behind this panel and then run it along right behind the upholstery panel and then to the back. Now, while I've got this light out and I have an extra wire run, I'm gonna take this opportunity to drill a hole straight through the roof. Now, I didn't drill this hole just for the sake of potential leaks. I actually had a reason. I can run the wire for this through. And that has a gasket, so hopefully it doesn't leak. It even came with little plugs to cover up the screw holes. I think that blends in pretty nicely. The brake lights work now too. Now I'm going to install these point of service lights and try out both the clear and the amber lens. I installed one with a clear lens in the engine compartment. I got plenty of light. I installed one with an amber lens over the dinette. Even though we already have a light right over here. Because that bright white light causes a problem at night. Here's looking out the front in the dark. That bright area over there is the dinette area. You see it pretty well directly in front of you. Now there's the amber light right there. You can still see it a bit, but it's a lot less intrusive. 
The Amber Light provides plenty of light for doing whatever game they want to play back here. That seems like it's going to work out. While I was wiring up these new lights, I realized that the small 4-inch one only does the high beam on signal. It doesn't work with the brake lights. And I think brake lights are the most important, so I want to work with that. And the signal. The problem with that is I have two different signals and they need to go to one bulb. Which is a problem I solved when I installed the trailer connector down here. The wiring I need is right here. I just need it to go to right there. So now I'm tearing apart all this wiring that works fine to do it differently. I got everything rewired again. Got my diodes mounted up here near the tail lights. I'm back feeding the trailer lights from here back down to the trailer connector there. Well, I'm changing out my flasher for an LED compatible one. And this is the old style one with the X, L, and P terminals. X is your battery, L is your load, and P goes to the indicator light on the dashboard. They make LED flashers that are direct replacement for this. I forgot to buy one, but I have this one that is good for LEDs and has three prong terminals. Fits right in the plug and doesn't work because these terminals are wired differently. This one has E, B, and L. B is battery, E is earth, so you ground it, and L is your load. It's time to make an adapter. Now I color coded my damper wires to make it easy to keep straight. So red is going to be our hot lead going in, case of this new flasher that is going to go to the B terminal. And then the other end is going to go where the X terminal, the old flasher was. Yellow is like our amber turn signal, so that's going to be our load. So that goes to the L terminal. Now in the old style flasher, the X terminal is in the same spot. The terminal where the load is on the new flasher is the dashboard light on the old one. The last terminal over here, which is load on the old flasher, is ground on this one. So we're going to put a black wire on that one. Let's jump it in. Let's see if it works. Let's make the right clicking sound. And finally we have all the lights working properly. Even the backup lights work well. Now the important question is, did I capture the idea of this paint job without actually doing this paint job? I think I got pretty close. It was always my dad's idea to paint it like this. He likes that. So, good enough. Now the paint job is far from perfect, but so am I. So we match. I just noticed a small drip coming out from the bottom. There are a lot of water tanks in here. We're going to do a short trip. I was supposed to have already gone a couple days ago, and we just had frost last night. So I'm hoping we don't have a major problem here with some kind of cracked tank. But it's a very slow drip, so I'm going to completely ignore it for now and deal with it later. I figure the only way to properly test a paint job is to go somewhere scenic. So we found some rocks. Well, that's it for this project. I'm calling this one a complete win. The insulation actually made it a lot quieter driving it. The lights are nice and bright, draw a lot less juice, and they all work. The paint is easy to touch up, and it looks good from a distance. And that is what I was going for. So I'm happy with all the results. Now I gotta winterize this one tonight because it's late November and it might freeze sometime, but I'll be back on another fun project soon. Hope you guys are having fun too, and we'll see you next time.